Lisa Ho is our next presenter, uh, and I'm so glad that she could be here. She's the academic director uh, for the iSchool's Master of Information and Cybersecurity program, and she'll be joined um, by Steve Rice, uh, who's from Apira, which, uh, let me see if I got that. It's the uh, Intellectual Property and Industry uh, Research Alliances uh, Department at Berkeley. Um, and he was a student in the program. So we get a 360 view of an online program from the instructional perspective and the student perspective. Um, so uh, let's see, Lisa, I think you can unmute yourself. Yep, and, thank you. And do you have slides or something? Do you want us to hand you the... Um, yeah, eventually the, I have a one just very simple slide um, I'll turn on in a moment. But I um, wanted to start off with thank you, uh, Bill, for the invitation and for all the hosts for um, inviting, us, inviting me to talk about the Mike's program, the Master of Information and Cybersecurity. And since Steve Rice is a Berkeley staff member also and has been um, part of the cloud meetups, I thought it would be great to have one of our alum join us. So thank you, Steve, for being part of this also. And we didn't um, particularly uh, coordinate. I'll, I'll just ask Steve to jump in as you have anything you want to um, add to whatever I'm saying. So I thought I'd just start in with the why, why how, what format that you suggested. And um, the ba basically starting off with why do we want to have a Master of Information and Cybersecurity program. If you think of Maslow's hierarchy, safety is right there at the base of the pyramid next to your air and your food and, and your water. And when you tie that safety to the ubiquity of the online world's influence on all aspects of our lives, digital as well as the atom space, you've really got a 21st century master problem, perhaps the problem of the 21st century. So, you know, that's, this is where, this is, this is a, an important part. Cybersecurity is an, unquestionably an important part of really focus of what we need to be looking at as a university, as an educational system. So in, so on our, our aspect of that on the iSchool side is you often hear about humans being the weak link. At the same time, you have security professionals like Wendy Nather arguing that technology and security really needs to be like a spoon. I should have a spoon in my hand. I don't, I don't have a, I'm, I'm right by the kitchen, but a spoon is out of, um, out of distance. Um, it's really hard to use a spoon wrong. And that's the way our technology needs to be. That's the way cybersecurity needs to be. So cybersecurity is really at the intersection of people and technology and information that's wrapped up in that technology. So actually this is, I wanted to emphasize that point with a little slide. So I, I will actually uh, try to do that. Try to get my presentation up so that you can see that. Um, Oh, wrong one. Sorry about that. Screen two, desktop two. There. Is that you see that picture of um, people, information, and technology being the inner and that intersection is where cybersecurity is, and that's where the iSchool is. That's where we. Um, have seen ourselves since we were, I mean, since we transitioned from being the library school to the School of Information, it's that nexus of people, technology, and information. So there's, you know, all that you hear about millions of jobs unfilled in cybersecurity. Security professionals have been in the business of protecting networks for decades, but as the field has ex exploded to protecting information and it's exploded to social engineering, the people aspect, and then our physical systems like cars and planes, those are all integrate, all part of that, um, the cybersecurity problem as well. There's just millions of, of jobs, millions of um, unfilled positions and skill gap. So what is, I don't, you know, whether it's 1 million or 1.5 million or 3.5 million, there's all sorts of statistics that you can point to. Um, but even that's even despite the fact that we have lots of certificate programs that you can take boot camps, 
all sorts of different ways to get into the cybersecurity field. However, the people who are trying to hire are still saying they're having trouble finding talent. So the iSchool is taking, doing our part to, um, to help define a trusted pathway into cybersecurity or within cybersecurity with our unique vision on that, our unique stamp on that. Um, so we believe that the field needs people with diverse back backgrounds to handle because we're talking about life, basically. Cybersecurity is talking about security, is talking about safety, is talking about our lives from all aspects of it. So we need people with diverse backgrounds to represent all the areas of, of life and that basically it's part of just um, who we are as humans. And we think this next generation of cybersecurity professionals needs to have strong technical professional capabilities. So we have the networking class, cryptography and software security. And at the same time, we need cybersecurity professionals to have deep contextual understanding of the ways with which digital security shapes society and people and organizations and individuals. We want to build in leadership capacity for the cybersecurity professionals as well. So that's the kind of overarching why of our um, of the program. Um, why why we need a cybersecurity master's degree. We talked with folks. The uh, CLTC, the Center for Long Term Cybersecurity, was has been a, a strong partner um, throughout this and. Um, interviewing cybersecurity leaders to find out what their needs were in cybersecurity. And these are the things that they're saying. They need people that have technical skills and the con context understanding and leadership. So uh, from that how, how, from that why perspective, I'll move to the how. <clears throat> um, and again, Steve, feel free to jump in at any point if you have um, thoughts that you wanna, wanna add here. Um, from the how perspective, I'm not going to, I didn't want to turn this into a how to turn your class online. If anyone's on TeachNet, you're getting an avalanche of, of, of uh, recommendations and suggestions and tips on how to turn your class on, online. But I did want to give an overview of how we're set up in general. So um, obviously it's ideal to design a program from the from a, in a course from the ground up as we have been able to. And so I give props to the faculty who are converting on the fly their courses immediate to to online versions in the in the case that we're in um, so we generally give at least eight months to a year in advance for pulling together a course and that involves building out the full course content with 90 minutes per week of the of the course of asynchronous material usually that's videos like green screen as was mentioned earlier um, in a studio and then 90 minutes of weekly intimate live zoom sessions for the faculty and about 15 students to be in class together to talk through and work through and work on and engage on the ideas that were presented and, and were given in the asynchronous material. So it would be a Zoom session like this, but with just basically one screen full of students and their instructor, their faculty member. And often, even among those 15, you're breaking out into smaller groups to work on projects, to have discussions, um, lots of outside of the, of the classroom collaborative projects required as well. Um, so we, the iSchool had an existing, a pre-existing relationship with 2U as a, an education partner for our data science program. And so leadership in the iSchool decided to expand that relationship for the cybersecurity program. So 2U handles the pre-admissions pipeline and getting marketing and getting the students, uh, or I'm sorry, the applicants into the door and those applications in. They turn those over to the iSchool admissions team um, and, the, and after the st students are admitted, then to you also um, steps in again with keeping a high touch relationship, kind of like a coach for students on going back to school or that kind of thing and managing their, um, managing their school work life balance. Um, while the iSchool student affairs staff handles the usual student affair type of thing and, and, and unusual issues that come up around dropping classes or any other, um, you know, functionality related to the university. So um, the, the courseware, coursework, the teaching, the uh, pedagogy, that is all Berkeley iSchool. Our partner provides the platform um, the, the learning management system does the pre-admission and does a kind of general um, light touch 
hand holding of any kind of uh, support, technical support for students, as well as um, whatever kind of um, life support they, they need and assistance with um, getting tutors or whatever, whatever kind of thing that they, I can't think right now. Um, we work, there's a, we, they offer we work memberships to students, things like that that provide per perks for them. Um, I wanted to address the question of why we did the course online. Uh, even before COVID-19, it just made sense to be online. We, if we're looking for students who are professionals, if we're a professional master's degree, we believe that a class environment is really rich when, you when students have professional experience to bring to that conversation. It just makes sense that our target audience is not gonna be able to uproot their families, uproot from their jobs to come to a residential program. So and be, I have to admit before being part of the Mike's program, I was a little skeptical of online degrees because my image was of a MOOC or it was only the you know, correspondence type course where you're just doing asynchronous material, that's all. And, and frankly, there's probably a little bit of elitism is in there because a lot of this online um, coursework and degrees are not from your tier one schools. And but so after being with this, the Mike's program and being a deep part of building those courses with the faculty, my opinion has completely turned around and I can um, maybe turn it to Steve to say your experience at I was I my experience is that these classes are the equivalent if not a better experience um, to being in the classroom. So um, I don't know, Steve, would you like to add anything to the to the, your experience about being a student online versus student in the class uh, and on campus? Sure, and that was a great intro. Like it, it, our student, can you hear me? Yep. Our student class um, introduced you to, to the great world of online teaching. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the, the the class went really well. I mean, you, you get used to it and we, we all are, are, we're really respectful about like keeping everything viewed and we're taking turns almost too much. Like everybody's kind of waiting for each other to talk, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a really great program in general. And um, it was reminding me of some of what Rich was saying about how when the professors make up a class, they can do interviews with people, they can, and they can show the videos and it, when, when they do the uh, asynchronous content. So the asynchronous can be anything that they can imagine. So we had a, a lot of classes that were interviews. Some of them were interviews with uh, real leaders in, in the field in different aspects of the field, risk management or, or cryptography or, something like that so that was that was really cool and the professors can manage the class differently they can they can manage how the in-person classes run um, you can be, they can open it up earlier they can stay later many times they've stayed later if we got into like good discussions or whatever um, so they can th there's it seems to be a lot of leeway a lot of freedom in even in, within the platform of how they can manage it it was it was strange when we part of the program is an, an immersion element where they invite people to uh, attend in person for about three days or so and that was one of the more surreal parts because you're you're used to seeing people online and and then all of a sudden you meet them in person and it's, it's like kind of the opposite of what we're all dealing with now um so then yeah and they they the props are very good about holding office hours and and um encouraging us to to use office hours both for instruction and for socializing and you know the professors they may be in in amherst massachusetts and so they they kind of want a connection to the students as well, or and a connection to Berkeley. So um, that part is that part is really is really helpful. Steve, could I jump in there for a moment about yeah. community? And uh, thank you for bringing that up, because that's a point that I wanted to raise as well. Is um, maybe it's it might be harder online in an online program to develop that sense of community that you that may come more organically or um, easily if you're. In a, in, an on, in a residential program or on the campus and seeing people and walking down the halls. So the iSchool is very 
and I also were very um, it, deliberate, but deliberate about trying to develop community. So there's, there's, you need to create ways for people to connect outside of the classroom and outside of the formal elements of the program. Um, one of the success stories I would, I would mention is, and sometimes those things come up just because of personality and some, you might have people who are just those connector people, but sometimes in a group or a cohort of students, you may not have those. And we saw in the very first cohort that Steve was in, there were a couple of folks who just were those connector people who without being prompted, made it into a community by engaging with individuals and talking with others. And we realized that, that actually doesn't happen just naturally necessarily. So creating, making sure that there are individual connections and there's room for people to have those intimate times for, um, for talking and just hanging out. The, the, the cohort rep for the first cohort um, set up a, a coffee house that goes on weekly on Saturday mornings to just come and hang out and there's no particular topic or agenda and it's just a time for people to get to know each other. Not everybody gets can come at that time, but it makes a huge difference in allowing students to get together and create that kind of community. So those types of things I would say kind of a takeaway of all of it would for me is um, online, you need to be deliberate about a creating community and find ways to make that happen in individual one on one, very small group um, formats. So back to you, Steve, sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. And I was going to say that uh, Slack, it, you know, talking about platforms that the to you learning management system was was important. And that that integrated with Slack, I mean, integrated with uh, zoom. And then the Slack was really important in communication socially with people outside of the class knowledge. So, and then it, the, you know, there's things you can use within Zoom. I mean, it's a little technical, but there's breakout rooms you can use for exams and for, um, you know, different projects when you want a smaller group. Um, that's more to Alex and people that are trying to set up classes, I guess. And um, some people ask, like, oh, can you have proctored exams? And yeah, we had we had midterms and finals in cryptography, and the we would each get our own breakout room, for example, and then the, the professor would go to each of the rooms and check on you periodically to make sure you're still okay taking the exam. So yeah, that's it. I I think it's a tremendously great program, and we're all you know we're going to be lifelong buds and it's, yeah, it's good job, Lisa. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, so the, the networking and being part of the community, we feel like is as big as important as the coursework and the, the content that the faculty are providing to students. So we, we do emphasize that the immersion program is, is one of those pieces in create, helping to create that community, even, even while, students were um, bonding online, having that in-person aspect just once in the program does make a big difference, I think, in seeing this is you in real life. Um, so that was, it's, a, it's an interesting, you know, footnote to that experience and that, um, you know, exercise of being all online, except for just that one little chance to be in person makes a big difference. Unfortunately, we had to cancel it. This it was scheduled for mid mid month this March um, for this year, but we'll see. If, hopefully, we'll get it back again. But I, there's some questions, but I don't want to take over the time, so I, I'll try to answer in um, in chat if you want to uh, keep going with the agenda. Well, since I posted the questions, I would love to hear. Uh, I think that would be valuable for us if uh, if you can address a few of them. Like uh, I had a couple, and then uh, Sid has one. Um, so grap the technology, grappling with technology, the, um, that a lot of that stuff that's on TeachNet that I'm hearing is on in the undergrad um, area with big classes, which as I said, we have 15 person classes. So a lot of the things that, that people are um, asking about are things that we are, are dealing with since it's a graduate level program. Um, we, the, um, testing I think is one of the things that people were talking about and we've really turned away from and many of the courses from testing feeling like at a graduate professional level 
people aren't there to learn how to do a test. I mean, there's sometimes when you need to have information at the tip of your fingers, but more often you need to know how to synthesize information and turn it back around in, a, in an important way, maybe quickly, but it's not something that um, an exam will necessarily be the best test of whether you have um, mastered that information and been able, being able to use it. So I think that's one of the things that's gone on a lot on TeachNet. Um, so I'll just say that being project-based is um, one of the solutions that we have in our in our class in our in our programs. Um, being a privacy officer has come up and there have been questions about well what about the zoom recordings can people from different sections come in to being um, come watch each other's recordings and it, I don't not it wasn't my experience as a privacy officer necessarily but um, it was definitely a question of interest we didn't talk about that when I was CPO um, but we, what we've determined at this point is that even though you would in a in an on campus setting have students from one section go to another section without any problem that's fine and we decided that it's fine to do that if it's the live section students can come in but the recording is a FERPA record and so that needs to be maintained like a FERPA record only for the students who are part of that course so that was an interesting I don't know that we've gotten um, a f official sign off from um, UCOP or others, you know, legally on that, but that's the current um, standing that stance that we're taking on that. Um, and Sid's and question. I was just going to say for um, communication within ourselves, like we, we had discussed, you know, addressing the privacy and security issues, like what kind of, you know, um, like, would we use Signal or we use Keybase and, you know, people would have different opinions about the security levels of Slack versus Keybase and, and Signal. So, um, so yeah, we had those discussions that were security privacy related to the tools that we were actually using. So we ended up using Slack mostly, but we did start off using Signal and tried using Keybase too. Um, then to Sid's question about um, areas of research that are not necessarily enterprise related. I appreciate that question because it brings to mind a couple of things. The program is a professional program, so it's not a, um, set up as a PhD academic style program where um, it's, a, it's not necessarily a stepping stone to doing research and the kinds of um, um, pure research the way the way that an academic might is very professionally focused but we do have students who are interested in doing research and they do um, research as part of their capstone projects a lot of their even class um, classroom course projects are research-based and some uh, specifically an area where that's on the edge um, and not necessarily enterprise approach at this time is in our privacy engineering class which is um, which was developed by by Daniel Aronke um, in partnership with the College of Engineering that's leading at the um, that's looking at the statistical aspects of privacy and how to keep big data sets um, pr provably private um, and it's really hard to find that being used in industry now in an enterprise um, sense Google and Apple are just touching that and starting to use those techniques, but it's not something that's enterprise wide. So that's some, it's a course that we're really excited about. Students have been unanimously um, uh, ecstatic about it as well, really. And even though it's really hard, very, very new to them as well, a new area, um, it's, but, it, but they felt like getting through a semester of it, they were able to then go out and give talks at at um, not notable conferences, SANS, um, other places, and RSA. That's an area that was really kind of on the research edge that we're trying to be on the leading edge to our, so our graduates can push that into um, their work in industry. So I, I, I think that's probably, I don't want to take up too much more of the time that was scheduled for others, so thank you very much for the chance to to talk with you all and I'm happy to answer any other questions on on chat or slack or email. Um, I'm at Lisa Ho at berkeley.edu and Steve, you can look up at IPRA as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Steve. That was that was really great.